We've been going through the book of Acts and seeing the progression and the building up of the church of Jesus Christ. In the last several weeks, we've been looking at some of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys to different cities where he shares the gospel message and he starts these churches in these cities. And we've seen him spend time in Thessalonica and Berea and Athens and in Corinth. And when he was done in Corinth, last week we we talked about how he made a, a vow to God. And he completed that vow in Corinth and was going to go to Jerusalem to, um, to offer, make an offering as a fulfillment of his vow. And so he leaves Corinth and he passes through Ephesus on his way to Jerusalem. And we see, we, we read that when he got there, he went to the synagogue and he taught. And some of the people believed the message, but others wanted him to stay longer. But he wanted to get to Jerusalem uh, to complete that vow that he had made. And so he leaves Ephesus to go to Jerusalem, and he leaves Aquila and Priscilla behind. Well, he leaves for Jerusalem, and along comes a man named Apollos. And he arrives in Ephesus, and he's teaching a message about Jesus, but it's an incomplete message. And last week we saw how Aquila and Priscilla, they took took Apollos and taught him the word of God more adequately uh, so that he was able to share the proper message. And after some time in Corinth, Apollos wanted to go on to Achaia, which would have been to Corinth, which was the capital city of Achaia. And in response to his desire to go to Corinth, the, the followers of Christ, they wrote letters of recommendation for him and sent him off. To Corinth. And now we come to Acts chapter 19 and the first 10 verses where it says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And Paul says, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And so we see Paul's experience as he returns to Ephesus. After that brief time as he was passing through on his way to Jerusalem, now he's back. And his experience with the believers in Ephesus reveal three truths. I'm sure there's more truths than that, but three truths about our God. And these truths can have a profound impact if we can learn to live by them. The first truth is this. The Spirit of God is present and personal. You know, the first thing Paul did, he came to approach some disciples when he entered into Ephesus. And the first thing he asked them was, um, have you received the Holy Spirit? And the response was, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Well, what baptism did you receive? Well, we received the baptism, John's baptism. And he says, well, John's baptism was for repentance. But there was one coming after him that we are to be baptized into. And that that person is Jesus through whom we receive the Spirit. And we read in Matthew chapter 3 where 
where, um, <coughs> where John the Baptist, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And it's one of those lessons that we need to learn, know, come to terms with. The fact that we are to be baptized in the Spirit of God. The baptism with water is for repentance of sins. And when Jesus came into this earth, or when he came and Jesus himself was baptized in the Jordan for, as, for repentance, when he came up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove and landed upon him. And the voice from heaven proclaimed, This is my Son, whom I love in whom I am well pleased. And so there's a spiritual act to that. There's a spiritual part to that. And in this passage, we see that Paul laid hands on, on the, the disciples and they received the Spirit and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And I think it's a good question for us too. Have we received the Holy Spirit? What baptism, what baptism have we received? We've received the, the baptism with water. Have we received the baptism of the Spirit? But how can we know? How do we know if we have the Spirit within us? It's a promise that God has given to us. Jesus gave to us. You know, I must go away. And prepare a place for you so that I can return and I can bring you back to be with, with me. But while you wait, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you another. I'm going to give you a counterpart. I'm going to give you a spirit. The spirit of God. And as we, if we believe in Christ, he has promised us his spirit. And if his spirit is in us, we can live by him each and every day because he is present and he is personal within us. We just have to learn and we have to seek God, asking him to help us to listen to the spirit of God. Through the words we read, the, the uh, conversations that we have, but we listen for his guidance because the Spirit that guides us into all truth, leads us into all truth. And when we hear the voice of God through that Spirit, that we obey what He says, trusting that He is guiding us to where we are supposed to be, that our lives are continually changing for the better, and that we are growing in faith and love and joy in the Lord. But do we believe that truth that the Spirit is present and personal? He is in us and wants to live through us every day. Another truth from this passage, number two, the kingdom of God is now and forevermore. It's now and forever. It's not something we are waiting for in the future. It is something that is taking place right now and this passage tells us that he went to the synagogues paul went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly of the kingdom of god so for like three months what is the kingdom of god no it's that it's the place that we are experiences experiencing his kingdom right here right now but also in eternity and some great pictures of that is, you know, Corinth. Here he's in Ephesus, but Corinth was a Roman colony. And I never realized this until uh, not uh, recent years. That Roman colonies were set up. That if you entered into a Roman colony back then, it's as if you were stepping into Rome itself. There was a familiarity 
there was a cohesion between a, a Roman colony and Rome itself. The streets would be alike. The, the money used would be the same. Everything would be the same as it was in Rome. The laws that were followed. And I think a, a good picture of that for us, or for me anyway, um, me growing up in the church that I grew up in, the Apostolic Christian Church, they were set up in a way that if you went to an Apostolic Christian Church, whether it was in Bluffton, or if you went to Peoria, Illinois, when you stepped into that church, it was the same. The same things were going on, the same uh, patterns of how, how church was done, that you knew you were in an apostolic Christian church. Or from a secular standing, if you go, into, if you go to a McDonald's here in the, in the States, you know what it's going to be like. But you could go anywhere in the world, and if you see the golden arches, when you walk into those places, there's going to be similarity there. You're going to be going in, and you know what you're going to be receiving when you go into those places. Well, in the same way, we are in the kingdom of God now and forever and eternity. You know, within the church itself, Jesus taught his, his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6. He says, This then is how you should, should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be your name. But then this next line. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what, what Paul was teaching and what God wants us to realize with that indwelling spirit that we have. That when we gather together as the church. That we are representing the kingdom of God. On this earth. When the people see. When the people of the world see the church at work. They are experiencing the kingdom of God. It should be as if. As soon as they walk through the doors. Or they walk into a. Uh, a meeting of the church of Jesus Christ that they are walking into the kingdom of God. That we're that representation of the kingdom as if we were in his kingdom now and forever and because everything is the same on this earth within the church as it is in his kingdom in the eternals. So we should be living a life that, and serving God in such a way that if people see the church, they are experiencing the kingdom of God. We have access to the heavenly realm, to the eternal realm, while we walk on this planet. And we'll see more of this as we continue on in the book of Acts, of how the, the church, the early church, represented that kingdom of God and how we should be representing that kingdom of God even today. But then the third truth from this passage is that the riches of God are searchable and limitless. You know, it tells us that you know, Paul went into the synagogue and he taught for three months, but then the Jews, they rose up against him, obstinate. And they forced him out of the synagogue. And so he takes the, the disciples that were following him. And he had daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And apparently it's, uh, commentary talks about, he returned, when, when the apostle Paul returned to Ephesus. It tells us when his efforts to teach in the synagogue were rebuffed. Paul rents a hall from Tyrannus where he teaches about Christ. Over the next two years, Paul's ministry impacts over two million people. And so he goes into this, this hall, the Hall of Tyrannus, and it says every day, every day they had discussions about Christ. Every day. 
And another commentary said that it would have been every day probably from like 11 to 4. Because back in that time, people would do their job, do their work until about 11. And then they would take a break from 11 to 4, the heat of the day. So from 11 to 4, every day, five hours a day, Paul was discussing Christ with these disciples for two years. And what that speaks to, to me, to us, is that they could meet daily and never exhaust the greatness of God. They could never exhaust the, the greatness of Jesus Christ. And that boggles my mind. Because sometimes I find it hard to talk for 20, 30 minutes. And Paul was talking five hours a day for two years. And still was unpacking who Christ was. And it's really, that's true for us too. You know, we should be able to un unpack what Christ is, who Christ is, and how he lives in us, and what he does in us and through us, and we never exhaust the greatness of our Savior. Now, you take a look at the things around us, our own planet, and we keep searching for things, and we keep finding new things. I think about the fossil fuels. That's a big issue, hot topic today has been for many, many years. We're going to run out of fossil fuels. But the more we dig, the more we find. Unfathomable, unsearchable, the riches that are within this planet in which we live, where we can find oil and gas, natural gas. We can find diamonds and and rubies, and, and in the seas we find pearls, and, and the more we search, the more we find. Or consider the universe in which we live. We are just a speck of dust in the galaxy in which we live, the Milky Way galaxy. And yet we are one of hundreds, if not thousands, or millions of other galaxies in this universe. As astronomers look to the skies, each and every day they're making new discoveries. And it's inexhaustible. And that's who Christ is for us as well. And Christ is represented in the scripture as, you know, when, when God led the people of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. The promised land is described as a land flowing with milk and honey. There were so many riches there, they would, they would be satisfied with all that is found in the promised land. Well, that promised land represents Jesus Christ himself. Where Paul talks about the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. The more we learn of him, the more we the less we actually know because there's always more and more and more that we can learn of who our Lord is, what he has accomplished, what he is doing here and now in us, through us, for us, by us. It's inexhaustible. And so I want to encourage you today that, you know, the truths of Scripture, the truth about the Spirit of God, in us, that we can get in tune with him and, and that he will guide us in our day-to-day -day walk with him. And when it comes to the kingdom of God, to, to understand and become that expression of the kingdom of God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And that we are part of the expression of that kingdom. And when it comes to the riches of God, the riches of Christ, that we are awestruck at all that God has for us, is doing for us, has done for us, and continues to do each and every day. And that through it all that we may represent him in everything that we do 
and say for his glory. God bless you. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.